On today's show, we prepare fish tacos with Chef Jerry Levine, hear original poetry from Sheila Lynch Bentonen, talk about romantic comedies, and what's happening in our South Shore towns. We're glad you're here. Let's get started. <music> Here's an event to make you go psycho. The Art of Hitchcock, a viewing and discussion series happening at the Duxbury Senior Center. One of the most influential filmmakers in the history of cinema, Alfred Hitchcock's career spanned 60 years, during which he directed more than 50 feature films, creating that unmistakable Hitchcockian style of suspense and tension that transforms viewer into voyeur. Curry College professor John Rico will lead this three-part series, including a screening and discussion of themes, intention, and the directing style of the famed master of suspense. The Art of Hitchcock will kick off on January 29th with Vertigo, continue February 26th with Dial M for Murder, and conclude with Shadow of a Doubt on March 25th. Each event runs from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. To register, visit DuxburySeniorCenter.org. Next up is poet Sheila Lynch Bentonen with the reading of her original work. Next, um, so Sheila Lynch Bentonen, Bentonen, did I say it correctly? Hello, I've noticed others, if you stand too close to this microphone, it whispers back at you. So I'm gonna to try to stay away. <laughs> uh, my name is Sheila Lynch Bentonen. I'm a member of the Duxbury Poetry Circle. I've never heard of the word Tullus as a prayer shawl before, but I call this my poetry shawl because it hides all sorts of errors of a 60-year-old. <laughs> yeah. So I, last night at the wine bar, which was so much fun, I read funny things about friends that were there. And the, tonight, I thought I would take you through a year in my neighborhood with short poems. January. My dog wakes me up, stirring me to go outside. That little peak of orange light right before dawn, the morning after a great blizzard. The silver moon and sparkling stars, still visible with the blue-orange very beginning of day. Light snow, taller than my tall boots. The dog bounds with joy like a kangaroo. Then, two owls hoot, hoot, hoot to each other before full, brilliant daylight begins. A brilliant blue flash set against the white fury, blue jay in a blizzard, magic. February, day after blizzard, sun glistening on pendants of ice hanging on the branches rivaling the finest chandeliers, snow frozen in peaceful white with blue shadows, belying the previous day of swirling drama and fury. March, the pond is white ice, cracking with a loud groan. The oaks and maples are snapping and whistling. The ducks and geese are shivering and sheltering but the native eastern great white pine is throwing its evergreen arms up to reach the cold sky as if to say, bring it on, March. Dear March, you are forgiven. Love, June. April. April pretends she is married to spring, but she's still dating winter. May, young lovers play and own the month of May. May is a prom queen, floozy pinks, diaphanous whites, 
air full of promise, warm and splendid, I want to dance. June, 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 strawberries in a full moon. July, all the weary world is miles away on a perfect July day. Summer breeze, flip-flops in my hands, toes in the warm tide pool, full moon rising over the ocean's horizon, late evening light, dusk by the July sea. August, August, laying on a sandy beach, all my troubles out of reach. August magic time, when the deep orange fire day lilies are blooming and you see that more are forthcoming and the silk on the top of the corn is blonde and smooth like it has been for thousands of August and the air is heavy and warm and people move slower and jump in cool waters wherever they are. When December seems like it could never happen again, you know you are in the midst of August magic time. September, September, the beginning of new beginnings. September, the marvelous maples, the bunches of birch, the burning bush, the, willy, the willowy willow, have started their leaf death autumn carnival. Multicolored majesty, more vibrant than a New Orleans street funeral. Note to self, leave this world in a blaze of color with the music on. October, I will never tire of October's leaves on fire. November, make the feast, stoke the fires, November is about to expire. November, my habitat. Languid, cold November Saturday morning, staying under the warm blankets. The dog lets me know it's time to go outside. Bundle, bundle, hat, sweater, coat, warm socks, etc. Frost on the garden, yellow russet and amber leaves crackle underfoot. The luscious summer green marsh grass has turned to thin, transparent straw. The red squirrel collects the precious acorns for the frozen forecast. The brant geese have arrived from the Arctic to winter on our coast. Soon the snowy owl will arrive. Hot tea swirls steaming mist, wood stove blazing, light slants strong, darkness descends early. Evening meals are warm and hearty. I am a happy citizen of late autumn here, a, a complete foreigner in the tropics. This is my habitat. December, the stars shine bright and Orion hunts on a clear December solstice night. Thank you. <laughs> How about some star energy to brighten things up in the dead of winter? On February 6th, the Blake Planetarium in Plymouth will be spotlighting our closest star and sole source of energy. You know her, you love her, the sun. The center of our universe is a three-part program presentation featuring sun, our living star, the incredible sun, and seasonal stargazing. In a state-of-the-art, full-dome format, you will be immersed in the true nature of the sun, witness images never seen before of the sun's raging surface, and gaze at a brief overview of the current night sky. The center of our solar system is happening February 6th at 7 p.m costs only $7 per ticket and is wonderfully appropriate for all ages. Please note, tickets are being sold online only. Visit Eventbrite, the center of our solar system, to purchase yours. Blake Planetarium is at the Plymouth Intermediate School at 117 Long Pond Road in Plymouth. Parking is free.
The Great Blizz Hockey Team is a nonprofit public charity whose motto is no hockey player left behind. Welcoming players with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and more, all playing together as one team, the Great Blizz welcomes you to attend the sixth epic battle between this closely knit team and Boston Bruins alumni. See the players you cheered on in the famous black and gold right here on the South Shore at the Kingston Bog Ice Arena in a friendly and familial game of camaraderie and mutual respect. This collegial, exciting, fun battle takes place on February 3rd from 1 to 3 p.m. Don't miss it. Visit the Eventbrite page to get your tickets. Next, we join Chef Jerry Levine in preparing a delicious and healthy meal. Today, he's making fish tacos. Hello and welcome to Delicious and Nutritious. My name is Jeff Jerry Levine, and I'm joined by Marsha Richards, registered dietitian from Beth Israel, Deaconess Hospital in the great town of Plymouth. Special thanks goes out to PAC TV and the Center for Active Living for helping us bring this show to all of you. And today we are going to do an interesting recipe, and it is called fish tacos. And uh, when Marsh is ready, Go for it. Okay, hi everybody and welcome to Delicious and Nutritious. Jerry has created once again an amazing recipe that is easy to prepare, it's delicious, and it's also nutritious. So we'll watch him create this um, marvelous meal and then I'll talk, I'll show you all the recipe and we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of fish. Today we are going to make Fish tacos. Now, what is a fish taco? Well, first off, what is a taco? All right, this is a taco shell. There are two different types of taco shells. One is made out of white flour or wheat flour. The other one is made out of a corn flour. It can be either the white corn or it can be the yellow corn, either way. So this is what we're going to do. Now, what are we going to do with this? Uh, we are going to take this and put it in our saute pan uh, and so we crisp it just a little bit, but it's not going to be hard because we want it nice and soft. Now the question is, where did I have my first fish taco? Well, I was out at a conference in California, uh, in San Diego, and with my chef friends, and we were walking along a beach area, and there was a wonderful smell of, of fish that was like it was cooked on maybe a flat top or something. And it was, the smell was magnificent. And I said, what is that smell? And the, one of the guys said, well, it's fish tacos. Haven't you ever had a fish taco? And I said, no. And he said, let's have fish tacos. So we went in there and they had a flat top. And it's a rectangular piece of metal that they use, uh, that chefs use in kitchens. And that's how they, and they call it a flat top because it's nice and smooth, it's flat. All right, what kind of fish were they using? They were using red snapper. Okay, and the, what was on this? Well, the first thing they did is they had their, their taco shell. This can also be called a fajita if you want to get technical about it. And they had a type of fish. Now, what am I using for fish? You can see that I have a, a fish which I call a white fish. Now, what does white fish mean? Usually it's a fish that has low levels of fat in it, which means that they're very mild. And uh, unlike uh, uh, something like a bluefish or salmon, which has a stronger flavor. Okay, now I'm going to do one thing with this. I want to cut this piece a little bit smaller. And this is haddock. And, and look at the whiteness of this. See how white that is? So it is a very mild fish. And... We, uh, and I'll cut this one also, just to make it easier. Okay, to get rid of these things. And what do we do next? A little bit of salt, kosher salt. And notice how small 
the amount is that I'm using. I don't need it a lot. And I'm going to do both sides. Okay. What else? Fresh ground black pepper. Dynamite stuff. Oh, I love the smell of this. Okay, we did that. And we pepper this here. And now we're going to do a quick flip. And one of the reasons why I cut it this size, it, it makes it easier to turn over when I am cooking. So, we take some kosher salt, a little bit of it, 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 and that's that. And we put some pepper, uh, fresh ground black pepper on here. A little bit there, and a little bit there, and a little bit there, and a little bit there. And we're going to take and we're going to heat up our pans and we're going to use the larger pan here uh, to cook the fish. The smaller one, which is a fajita size, taco size. And I'm going to turn them on right now. What kind of saute pans are we using? We are using a Teflon pan. I like Teflon because it's, it's easy to work with. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to put our fish on our preheated pan. Now, you hear the sizzle? Sizzles are good. And the question is, is how long are we going to cook these? Well, there's, a, there's a, a theory that the Canadian government uh, has used for many years, and they say cook fish, for one inch of cooked fish, you use 10 minutes of cooking time in a saute pan. 10 minutes of cooking time. So I'm going to look at my watch here. And uh, we're going to, we're not, these are much thinner than one inch. So we're not going to take one inch to cook. Now, we need to do something with the fajita. So we flip it in there. Look at it, look at it go. And we are going to watch this because we don't want it to burn. And boy, the smell of the fish is really good. Now, why are we using a mild fish? Because people that like to have tacos like a mild fish. What's it, what are some fish that are, are not mild? Well, tuna for one thing, fairly strong. Bluefish, very strong. And needs to be eaten as quickly as possible after it is caught. So you don't fool around with bluefish. You eat it immediately. And it, it's delicious. So. We are going to flip this, and there we go. We got a nice little flip there, and we're going to get a nice little flip. Whoops! Going to get a nice little flip there, and we're going to get a nice little flip there, and a nice little flip there. And don't worry about if uh, if it, a little bit of it sticks. And, and it's really not that significant. Now, the, the taco, we want to take it and, and do a quick flip on the taco. And you'll notice we've got a little color on it. And that's all that I wanted. Because it, it actually adds a lot of flavor. And we're going to just take that now, put it in my hand, my chef finger, and take it off and put it right there. Yes, that is good. And we are going to flip our fish here. Nice flip. Nice flip. Nice flip. And another nice flip. And we are probably, I would say we're four minutes into this. So we're going to take our fish off in a 
in a moment or two. And I've got a plate that is over here that we're going to use for our fish. And we also have some fresh onion that I've diced and some fresh green bell peppers. And they're going to go on also. Okay. Okay, we're taking the fish off now. Taking another piece of fish off now. And the fish will continue to cook for a while while it's on the plate. There we go. Lovely. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the um, nutritional values a little bit too. About fish. I got a quick, uh, you used haddock, which, uh, which I prefer haddock as to cod. Do you feel that haddock is um, a little, um, has a little more body than a cod? Uh, the, the density is a little it's, bit thicker. Yeah. Uh, the flavor profile is definitely different. Yeah. Uh, to be truthful with you, I'm with you. I like haddock better than cod. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Marcia has got her uh, slide up. So um, the recipe is exactly what Jerry just did, about a one pound of white fish sprinkled with a little salt and pepper, some olive oil in the pan, your tortilla shells, fajita shells, taco shells, whatever words um, you want to call them, some diced green pepper and yellow onion and a salsa. This is a medium salsa, but you could definitely choose a spicier or a milder. And you, we all saw him cook it so easy, made it so simple. And one of those tacos, and that was a good sized taco shell, would be under 200 calories. So you could definitely add a side starch, maybe some rice or perhaps some beans or um, a vegetable, definitely add a little bit to this meal. But if you take a look at the nutrient profile, it's a great source of potassium. It's a great source of fiber. It's not too, too bad in sodium, considering it's fish from a seafood, mm -hmm. and it's um, a good source of protein at 22 grams. And if we can get 20 or 30 grams per meal, that is really good. Um, vitamin C and vitamin A are not on there, but because of the salsa, the onions, and the peppers, this would also be a good source of those nutrients. So a little bit, um, Harvard did a study, um, actually reviewed about 200 different studies recently. And what they found is that um, people who eat about three ounces of fish one to two times per week had a 36% less risk of dying from heart disease, which is pretty significant. That's really, really good. By eating something delicious like this once or twice a week, it's affordable. It was easy. It looks out like you could have leftovers and have it again the next day or maybe the day after. I'll let Jerry speak to how long you can keep the fish in the fridge in a second. Um, but what's unfortunate and why we love to do this particular show is that Despite the deliciousness, the ease, and the health benefits, only about a third of U.S. citizens are eating fish one time per week. And, you know, it's kind of something that is affordable. You don't have to buy the real expensive fish. Um, so um, that's the health benefits. I think we know um, I can't belabor that point anymore. And any white fish would do, Jerry. It, it could be white fish on sale, frozen fish. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it all depends upon what kind of fish you like. Now we have, uh, you know, we had comments on haddock, codfish work, uh, Atlantic pollock works, uh, tilapia works, catfish works, 
any of these things will work. Now, the question that you brought up a moment ago was, uh, how long can you keep fish in the refrigerator? Mm -hmm. Well, it, part of that is how long has the fish been in the supermarket? Yeah. And, and, and that is an issue. Normally, the supermarkets uh, get a delivery towards the end of the week, and then they try to sell out by Monday. So if you buy fish, I would buy fish on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, and, and and even into Friday. Uh, so, but now, how long in the refrigerator? Two days, three days, probably. But use your nose, and the nose knows. <laughs> really is is if it doesn't smell good, do not eat it. Okay, because fish should have a real nice clean smell, mm -hmm. and if it's fishy. It's not and, uh, un unless we're talking about something like bluefish and bluefish is very fishy smelling. But as as we as we said, you know, you, you it uh, it needs to be eaten very quickly. Uh, I'm willing to take questions. What about how, having... how long does cooked fish last? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, say again. Cooked fish, once you've cooked it. Yes. Oh, how long? Okay. Uh, a day or two in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. uh, cover it with uh, some uh, some plastic wrap and, um, and and eat it. But, you know, the, the fish is so good. Don't let it sit around. And, mm -hmm. and just, you know... If you have some of it on Monday night or Tuesday night, and uh, do something different with it uh, on 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 th Wednesday, take it and mix up a little green salad and kind of crumble the fish and put it into the little green salad, mm -hmm. or take some uh, couscous and put it into the couscous. Be creative, <laughs> Marilyn. Marilyn, you are muted. I didn't hear you say whether or not you put Pam in your pan when you were cooking the fish or a little bit of olive oil. Did you, did you put something in the pan? Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I would spray it with a little bit of, um, and I don't like, I don't want to use the word Pam because there are a number of different sprays and they're all a very, just get a nice vegetable spray and all you need is a tiny bit of it. And you know something? When we put the fish in there and you heard that little sizzle, mm. that's partly from the oil. Yeah. So uh, it's it's easy to do. And that is one of the reasons why I like to use a Teflon pan, because it doesn't stick. And the cleanup is easy. Thank you, so. Jerry. I have to go to the store and get some fish now to cook. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. You know, um, you, you saw how simple it was. Yeah, yeah. And I did the same thing when I when Jerry first <laughs> sent me the recipe for um, the nutrient analysis. I did the exact same thing. I called him up. I said, "I'm going out to get some fish. I know what we're having for supper tonight." And it was so good. Yeah, it was so. Good. I ha I have to say. I do something with my fish taco that Marsha may say is not a good idea. <laughs> I put a little dollop of sour cream right That's on the top. Sounds perfect I, to me. <laughs> no, it sounds okay to me. A dollop it's delicious. will always be fine. Moderation. 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 And um, I'll do mango salsa, too. <gasps> yes. That's yes. Nice. That's pretty tasty. You know, the, the salsa that I get is uh, the Paul Newman, and I get the pineapple salsa. Yes, oh, delicious. Awesome on anything. It is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I'm going to take it um, off and I'm going to go to the market. Believe it or not, we're at our time. It flies by so quickly. So we're looking forward to seeing you all for our next segment, which is going to feature a dessert that will also be healthy, delicious, and on the festive side. So I'm going to leave you hanging. This will be our cliffhanger. But 
from um, Jerry and PAC TV, Tom at PAC TV and the Plymouth Center for Active Living. Would like to thank all of you for joining us. And without you, delicious and nutritious would not be possible. And Jerry and I hope you enjoyed this month's recipe. And it sounds like you're all going to try to make it. So we'll look forward to hearing how much you enjoyed it. Excellent. So, thank, thank you. Enjoy thank the you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. All of you, Happy too. And have a wonderful thank day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 thing there's no escape but there is help for your taxes the AARP tax aid team is ready to help with your tax return preparation this year the process for making appointments has changed beginning on January 24th rather than call your senior center please call the AARP tax aid phone number directly at 781-689-0406 Leave your name, number, and best time to reach you. You can alternatively email kingstontaxaid at gmail.com to request an appointment. An AARP team member will get back to you to schedule your appointment's date and time. Once the appointment has been scheduled, drop by the Kingston Senior Center to pick up your tax packet containing instructions and other forms to be completed beforehand. The AARP team will be operating at the Senior Center on Mondays and Tuesdays beginning February 5th through April 9th. It's midwinter, which means the temperature in New England has dropped down to curl up by the fire with a good book. If your to-be-read pile is getting low, Bookstagrammer, book club leader, and voracious leader Jody Blanchett has some suggestions for you. Book Rex is a live virtual gathering happening on February 6th at 7 p.m. and will be 30 minutes of Jody's hand-picked book recommendations. Register for the Zoom link via the Plymouth Public Library. All participants will receive a list of the recommendations discussed. Our arteries, veins, and capillaries keep our oxygen-rich blood flowing from our heart to our tissues and organs and back again. And we know that good vascular health is imperative for an active and healthy lifestyle. But what are the signs and symptoms of vascular disease? And once identified, what are the treatment options? To answer these questions and more, the Plymouth Center for Active Living invites you to join Dr. Stratton Danes on January 31st at 1.15 p.m. at the center for an important overview of this vital system. Dr. Danes is a board-certified vascular surgeon with the Vascular Care Group Plymouth and at Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth. Drop-ins are welcome, but registration is appreciated for this free program. Next up, we go to our Open Here podcast, where Tiff takes a look at romantic comedies. Hi, friends. How the heck are you? I'm great. Thanks for asking. Romantic comedies. We love them. Some of us hate them. Some of us hate them and watch them anyway. I mean, what are you supposed to do after a bad breakup? You watch a romantic comedy, experience that beautiful happy ending where the lovers kiss in the rain and you feel better ish. But whether or not you love romantic comedies, you have to admit they tend to follow a formula. So today we're going to talk about the tropes that make this formula work or not work because sometimes the happy ending doesn't exist for everyone. So without further ado, let's chat about rom-coms, shall we? Trope number one, woman who's afraid of love. Once upon a time in a faraway land called New York City or San Francisco or some other famous city that is really big but everyone seems to know each other anyway, there lived an independent businesswoman with no time for love or is afraid of love because her parents were divorced or because Jacob Pinsky pulled her pigtails in the third grade or because her boyfriend ran away with a Swedish supermodel named Olga. Sophie or Darla or Laura or some other two-syllable named female then meets a dreamboat who makes her think, maybe I could love, but I can't because I'm broken. But maybe, just maybe, this stud is the one who can glue me back together because behind every woman is a man who can make her a whole human, apparently. But I think more important than that, it seems like this trope proves that boundaries aren't important. 
whatever her reasons are, a woman can say, no, I'm not ready. And we find it romantic that the guy is so strong-willed, so madly in love, that no means yes. When you attribute finally wearing down a person's boundaries to create a happy ending, morals tend to get a little hazy. This also means you, Ryan Gosling in The Notebook. I know we love that movie, but legit, that guy threatened to jump off a Ferris wheel if she didn't go on a date with him. No means nobody. All right, I could write a whole dissertation on this, but let's move it along. Trope number two, fake relationships. Hmm, who doesn't love a relationship that's based with a lie? The biggest culprit of this is pretty much any movie involving Sandra Bullock. We love our girl Sandy, but remember that time she pretended to be that dude's girlfriend and while you were sleeping? You know, that guy that was in a coma? Or that time she manipulated her assistant into becoming her fiance that she could, so she could maintain her green card in the proposal? I'm not questioning Ms. Bullock's ethics, but rom-coms like these seem to make light of some pretty deceitful behaviors. In While You Were Sleeping, for example, the main character not only lies about her relationship, but also lies to a family of really nice, albeit dysfunctional people. And the movie people are like, it's okay, she's lonely. The audience will totally be able to get down with the lies, as long as she's likable. I guess the question with this trope is, do the ends justify the means? Is it when you get there, not how you get there? I'll leave you to ponder that tidbit while we move on to trope number three, the makeover. Ah, behold, the trope that did not age well. The utterly horrifying, ridiculously superficial makeover. This happened a lot in the 80s when rom-coms were feeling their John Hughes era, but in the 90s, we had some doozies too. I bring you exhibit A, she's all that. At a very typical Californian high school where they eat lunch outside, there's a jock who makes a bet with his super cool friends that he can take any girl in school and make her popular. Of all the things that could possibly make a person uncool, he chooses the one girl who wears glasses. <laughs> oh, and a ponytail. And of course, she has the makeover. And of course, she makes the archetypical slow motion walk down the stairs, as one does, and they fall in love. All because she took out of her glasses and took out her scrunchie. It's bad enough that you're going to attribute someone's appearance to whether or not they're worthy of your attention. But he also considers all women to be interchangeable, treats a girl like a commodity. Then the girl thinks, well, I can forgive him because deep down beneath that chauvinism, he's a really good guy and kind of hot. And you know, maybe I can fix him. What girl doesn't like to flip a man like a house on HGTV? Trope number four, the noble sidekick. It is a rule in every romantic comedy that there must be a best friend, a sidekick, a noble bestie with an arsenal of one-liners that makes us yell at our TVs, oh no, they didn't. Yes, they did. The sidekick is usually a woman of color or a gay man or a gay man of color. These sidekicks usually have no storyline of their own other than the occasionally being thrown a love interest in the last 30 seconds of the movie with absolutely no context at all. They also have to say, girl, or mm-hmm. Rupert Everett, Nathan Lane, Billy Porter, Wanda Sykes, Viola Davis, Octavia Spencer are all super talented actors that for years were given the best friend role when they are very much stars in their own right. Not cool. I've been watching rom-coms since I was an embryo, and I'm embarrassed to say that it took me a while to realize that this is straight up ick. Admittedly, I do dig a good rom-com from time to time. Sometimes, even a bad one. Okay, most of the time they're pretty bad. But you have to ask yourself, is it a happy ending for everyone? Romantic comedies are problematic for a plethora of reasons. As previously stated, they lack diversity, reek of misogyny, and play onto some really troublesome stereotypes. But there are some films out there that are changing the rules, with some of the same tropes, but a few twists in an array of beautifully diverse, slightly more complex characters. I said slightly, these aren't Oscar winners here. And for the record, I'm not asking you to turn your back on rom-coms. But film is a powerful medium, and people take these messages and use them as inspiration for their everyday lives. Watch the elder romantic comedies with a light touch, with the idea that we have advanced culturally. As for modern movies, let's take the rom-com and turn it on its head. Invite everyone to the table, send messages that women are allowed to have a life outside the male gaze, and realize that everyone's happiness does not depend on one human. Let's give these characters the most lovely, robust lives that we all deserve. And I'll leave you with that. Thanks for tuning in. Let's hang out again soon. And that, my friends, wraps what's good and good to know this week on the local scene. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.
Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to the local scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.